And welcome to Linux Action News, episode 264, recorded on October 26th, 2022. I'm Chris. And I'm Wes. Hello, Wes. Let's do the news. Canonical announced Ubuntu 2210 this week. Codenamed Kinetic Kudu, this interim release seems to have a particular focus on the Raspberry Pi. I don't mind that at all. Ubuntu 2210 now supports the micro Python goodness on various microcontrollers, including the Raspberry Pi Pico W. Also, the Ubuntu graphics stack has transitioned to KMS, meaning developers can run Pi based graphical applications, say using something like Qt, without a desktop session and without Pi specific drivers. You can see that it's great for a lot of hardware installations. This complements also expanded support in this release of Ubuntu for all kinds of displays like e-ink hat series, the hyperpixel range, and even the Raspberry Pi official touchscreen. The GNOME desktop was updated to version 43, which includes GTK4 theming for improved performance. And Pipewire also becomes the default audio system with 2210, along with WirePlumber as the session manager making this now a common stack across modern Linux desktops. And finally, an area that Canonical was drawing special attention to is their new Steam Snap. They noted that it includes the latest Mesa, presumably with the ability to decode video, and gamers can now be confident they'll always be up to date, regardless of their host OS, without needing to configure any of those gross PPAs that somebody came up with. And, you know, maybe this isn't absolutely necessary on an interim release like this particular one, but you could see how this snap is going to be very useful on future LTS releases. But you can hear more of our thoughts on the overall release in Linux Unplugged episode 481. Git T, a lightweight, self-hostable GitHub alternative written in Go, hit six years old this week. And for their birthday, well, they've had a few announcements, the biggest of which is the formation of a company called GitT Limited. Okay, they say, of course, quote-unquote, that GitT will remain open source, and they say a community project. It seems the primary goal of forming the company is around engaging in commercial support contracts, instance hosting, managing trademarks, and offering part-time employment to some maintainers, perhaps expanding that to full-time employment in the future. One rather surprising aspect to this announcement, though, is that it seems GitT is considering creating a decentralized autonomous organization, or a DAO. Now, they say that's to preserve the community aspect of the project, and contributors would receive benefits based on their participation, such as from code, documentation, translations, and perhaps even assisting individual community members with support questions. Not a structure we see commonly adopted in open source, but possibly could be done well. And, of course, could also be done very poorly. But it is something we'll be keeping an eye on. The Asahi Linux team shared some big updates on their path to getting Apple M-Series SOC support in the Linux kernel. The Apple M-Series CPU frequency driver is finally looking like it's in good shape, which will definitely help the system manage performance, thermals, and power efficiency. Yeah, that is really good because these laptops and some of these systems are famous for their good battery life. And this is going to help accomplish that under Linux, too. It also seems that the GPU driver is getting a lot closer. Originally, they were really banging on this thing under Mac OS and trying to pass all the compliance tests in theory under Mac OS and then move it over to Linux. Well, that's been done now. And now it's passing 99% of the compliance tests under Linux, which means the driver is getting to a really good state. While it might be a little hard to hear for those of us who still remember the excitement of the 486 CPU, the discussion around maintaining support for that classic architecture in the Linux kernel came up again this week. After reviewing code that mostly just seemed to be a series of workarounds for various older CPUs, Linus mused, quote, We got rid of i386 support back in 2012. Maybe it's time to get rid of i486 support in 2022? He later went on to say, quote, So I really don't think i486 class hardware is relevant anymore. Yes, I'm sure it exists, but from a kernel development standpoint, I don't think they are really relevant. At some point, 
people have them as museum pieces. They might as well run museum kernels. And perhaps what really matters, and was pointed out later in the thread, it seems no one really wants to stand up and offer to do the work to maintain that support. The I-486 architecture debuted in 1989 and was succeeded by Intel's Pentium in 1993. Linode.com slash LAN. Go there to get $100 in 60-day credit on a new account. It's a great way to support the show, too. Linode is fast, reliable cloud hosting. It's simple, affordable, and accessible to whatever your skill level is. And they have the best support in the business because they're architected like nobody else in the business. Linode's how we run everything. Whatever we've built in the last couple of years, we deploy it on Linode. My personal site, my family stuff, game servers, I run it personally on Linode too. They have a Linux culture that runs deep. They've got fantastic support. And they're 30 to 50% cheaper than the hyperscalers out there that want to lock into their crazy platforms. But I also think Linode truly has the best performance. And today they got 11 data centers around the world with a dozen more coming online next year. And they have a bunch of great features besides just running your applications really well. S3 object storage, cloud firewalls, easy to understand backups, Kubernetes support, and a dashboard for days. So go build something. Go learn something. Try it for yourself for real. $100 means you can really try it. Linode.com slash LAN. Go there to support the show and try it out. Linode.com slash LAN. Collide.com slash LAN. And a big thank you to Collide. Collide is endpoint security that uses the most powerful untapped resource in IT. Your end users. They do things differently. Instead of treating every device like Fort Knox that locks it down and makes it slow, they work with your users. Collide will automatically notify your team when their devices are insecure and give them step-by-step -step instructions on how to solve the problem. They reach out with a friendly Slack DM and educate them. And for IT admins, you get a brilliant dashboard that lets you monitor the security of your entire fleet. Maybe it's a Mac, maybe it's Windows, or maybe it's Linux. Collide supports it all. In fact, just a couple of days ago, their official macOS Ventura support dropped. They're right on top of that kind of stuff. It's truly great because in a snapshot, you can see if they have a password manager, if they have their OS up to date, if they've been following the guidelines and the requirements of IT. And it's perfect for generating a report for yourself, for leadership, maybe an audit. That's Collide, really. It's user-centered, cross-platform endpoint security for teams that slack. You can really meet your compliance goals by putting users first. You visit collide.com slash land to find out how. When you go there and activate a free trial, they're going to hook you up with a goodie bag too that includes a free t-shirt. So that's K-O-L-I-D-E dot com slash land. Collide.com slash land. We end this week on the roundup of recent Red Hat news. Now, Linux in the clouds, that's nothing new. But an on-demand remote Red Hat Enterprise desktop is rather noteworthy. Red Hat announced the general availability of RHEL Workstation on AWS. Joining Ubuntu and Windows, which both already offer remote virtual desktops on Amazon's cloud. The product is basically just a virtual Linux workstation that can be accessed using a thin client or just a web browser. It's a cheaper alternative for some specific types of workloads, and includes dedicated GPU options and other G-Family accelerated instance types that are suitable for remote workstations. Yeah, that makes sense. And hopefully it gives Red Hat a solid business reason to invest more in desktop technologies. I note that customers with Red Hat's cloud access can use their existing subscription to RHEL Workstation to deploy on AWS with no additional license required. I mean, you, of course, you still got to pay for your machine time on AWS, but that's nice to see. And keeping things in a Red Hat theme here, Stratus 3.3.0 was released this week. They say it includes one significant enhancement and several more minor enhancements, as well as more than just a couple of stability and efficiency improvements. Just a reminder for some of you out there, Stratus is a storage tooling solution from Red Hat that leverages XFS and LVM to manage Linux storage devices and provides features similar to ZFS and ButterFS. And in 3.3.0, it's become easier to use additional space on devices. And behind the scenes, Stratus is a bit more conservative now when allocating space for the thin pool metadata device. That's also really nice to see. 
there is some good tech in Stratus and some really good work going into it. It's sort of a shame that it just doesn't seem to be the solution the industry wants right now. Thankfully, Fedora has ButterFS, and that seems to be going great. However, this week we did get an update that Fedora 37's release will probably slip again. Yeah, you know, this happens sometimes. As we record, the decision has not yet been finalized, but the team is trying to decide how to deal with an impending critical open SSL update that was only just recently announced. Understandable. And the patch won't ship until next Tuesday, November 1st. It's going to be version 3.0.7, and it includes a fix for potentially multiple issues, one of which has been marked as critical. So, as we record, like Wes said, the team is debating the best move. You can follow Matthew Miller on Twitter directly. For the latest, he'll have that, I'm sure. Or, you know, tune in here because we'll keep an eye on Fedora 37, that open SSL vulnerability, and everything else going on in the world of Linux and open source. So head over to linuxactionnews.com slash subscribe for all the ways to get every single episode. And linuxactionnews.com slash contact to take a guess at when you think Fedora 37 will actually ship. Did we miss a story? Boost in with a new podcast app and tell us which story you would have liked to have seen us cover. We'll be back next week with our take on the latest Linux and open source news. Thanks for joining us. And that's all the news for this week.